Okay, so um, um, so first of all, well, I guess there's only a few people here so far, but um, I usually stop by start by asking if there's any questions left over from things that happened before or anything like that. Okay, well then after that. In this course, I like to start by um, um, saying where we are in the book. So, um, so we know that the main question of the book is how are synthetic a priori judgments possible? And um, there are two parts to the answer. I think I'm really sh not sure even after all this time exactly what Kant means by elements, but the book is divided into two parts. The first part is called the doctrine of elements, which is by far the longer part. And all our readings are gonna be from the doctrine of elements. The second part is called the doctrine of the method. So, I mean, this is like in a recipe, like a cooking recipe, you know, like first there's ingredients and then method. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't think that's Kant's immediate model, but uh, like logic books in his time typically begin with the doctrine of elements, which was about concepts, judgments, and syllogisms, or uh, that is arguments. And then a uh, second part, which was about method, like how to put those things together to make a science or something like that. So um, so what I said I'm not sure about is what are the elements supposed to be? But I think maybe the elements are, are the, the two parts of the doctrine of elements. So one is called the transcendental aesthetic. And the other is called the transcendental logic. I guess these are probably also called transcendental, talk, transcendental doctrine of elements and transcendental doctrine of the method. I don't remember what it says in the table of contents, but almost every section of the book begins with transcendental. Um, anyway, so these are the two elements, I guess, in the doctrine of elements, the transcendental aesthetic and the transcendental logic. Um, so this one, the transcendental aesthetic is about, um, uh, so like, remember, there's two things we need for knowledge, according to Kant, or to be able to represent objects. Uh, and one is the senses, and the other is the understanding or intellect, right? So the transcendental aesthetic is about the first one of those sources, sensibility, the senses, and um, and by uh, discussing the way um, sensibility yields synthetic a priori judgments, Kant thinks he can explain the possibility of mathematics. Right. So the transcendental aesthetic is about. Uh, synthetic a priori judgments somehow based on sensibility. And it explains how synthetic a priori knowledge is possible in mathematics. Whereas the transcendental logic, should have left more room here, but oh well. Right.
So the transcendental logic is about how something about the understanding or intellect yields the possibility of synthetic a priori judgments. And on the basis of that, he's going to explain the possibility of the part of metaphysics that he thinks is possible, and also the impossibility of the part of metaphysics that he thinks is impossible. Um, so the reading for today is most of this part, the transcendental aesthetic. The transcendental aesthetic is much shorter than the transcendental logic. Because as I said, Kant thinks before, as I said before, Kant thinks that this is the easy case, right? Both in the sense that he thinks everyone agrees that there's, well, he's, I mean, most people don't focus on the question of whether it's analytic or synthetic in his terminology. But anyway, everyone agrees that mathematics yields substantive a priori knowledge, according to Kant, even Hume. Again, that's a little bit dubious uh, about Hume, but that's what Kant says about Hume. So, um, so it's the easy case in that sense, and it's also the easy case in the sense that Kant thinks he can explain uh, pretty easily how we get the possibility of synthetic a priori judgments in this case. This part is most of the book, The Transcendental Logic. So I'll be started be reading the, the end of the transcendental aesthetic and the very beginning, first few pages of the transcendental logic for uh, next time. Okay. Um, so that's just to locate where this reading is. Are there any questions about that before I erase it? Again, if you have a question, you can either unmute yourself and ask it, or you can ask in the chat. Should turn off that ball. Uh, I don't remember how to do this. Oh, there we go. Uh, and... Oh, I All right. Um, so to understand what Kant says about sensibility and mathematics and how synthetic a priori mathematical judgments are possible, um, you need to first of all understand this uh, uh, complicated terminology he introduces to uh, talk about the different parts of our possible knowledge of an object. So, um, such as you know, intuition, thought, sense, sensibility. Sensation and a bunch of others. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, explain that terminology, which means explaining a lot of details about how Kant thinks we know or represent things. Then the second thing I'm going to do is um, explain what Kant means by saying that space and time are pure forms of intuition. And once uh, you, or if you understand what Kant means by calling them pure forms of, of intuition, then I think it's indeed relatively easy to understand how they make a certain kind of synthetic a priori judgment possible. Um, so answering that 
part of the main question of the book will also be part of this. Um, I mean, just like roughly speaking, remember the question that we're, we're asking when we want to know how a synthetic a priori judgment is possible. A synthetic judgment in general connects two concepts A and B that where like there's nothing about the content of A that implies that that what it that that an A has to also be a B. So you look into the definition of A, so to speak, and you don't find anything about B. So remember Kant said in the introduction, there must be something else X that connects the two of them. And in the case of synthetic a posteriori judgments, that something else X is experience. So in the case of mathematical judgments, roughly speaking, that something else X is pure intuition. So um, that's why I say that explaining what Kant means by this claim will also mean explaining how he answers this question for mathematical judgments. Um, and then third, if I have time, I hope to get to this, I'll also explain Kant's argument. for the above. That is how Kant tries to prove that space and time are the pure forms of, of intuition. Um, if I don't get to that or don't get into enough of it this time, it will probably run over into next time. Um, okay, so, but I'm gonna start with this one first. Okay, so first of all, a representation and so this is what Kant calls what, let's say, Descartes or Spinoza would call an idea. Kant uses the term idea for something else. Um, and he thinks their use of it for this purpose is a big mistake. And he actually will we'll read him talking about why a lot later in the course. But this is just um, like, to, especially if you had 100B to connect it with what those people are saying, it's, it's much less like what Locke calls an idea. But it's it's pretty much the same thing as what Descartes or Spinoza called an idea. What is it? Well, it's a special kind of being, a special kind of entity. Um, and uh, so, first of all, like every entity, it has a certain um, essential quality. Quality is how how we translate Kant's German term Beschaffenheit, which um, in other places, he uses this equivalent to qualitas in Latin. Um, Kemp Smith translates the Beschaffenheit many different ways, like as nature or constitution or character. So, uh, but in any case, every being has a certain essential quality that makes it what it is, makes it the kind of thing it is. And in the case of a representation, um, the kind of thing it is, is a mode or accident um, um, which exists in a certain subject. And the subject is a thinking subject or mind. So this is the representation. Um, this is the same thing idea that Kant, uh, Descartes says about ideas. An idea is a mode of a thinking thing. Um, and uh, to understand what that means, uh, um, it's like the relationship between um, uh, 
physical thing like a, a, and a body and its shape, for example, right? The shape is what like Descartes would say is a mode of an extended thing. So it's um, a characteristic that it has. It's not uh, an essential characteristic, right? A body doesn't have to have a particular shape. It could have a different shape. A mind doesn't have to have a particular representation. It could have a different representation. Um, but that's what it is. It's a, so it's a, a dependent kind of being that can only exist in something else, in a subject. And the subject, right? In the case of the shape, the subject would be the the body, right? Like a certain rock or something would be the subject. In this case, the subject is a certain mind, a certain thinking thing. Um, and uh, the nature that a representation, just like everything else has as what it is, its essential nature is what following um, Descartes, and Descartes following earlier people calls its form or formal reality. So the form or formal reality of a representation is the essential quality that it has as a modification of, of a subject, which is a thinking thing. Um, okay, my phone is going off. I'm not going to answer that, but I do remember I have to unlock the door. Hold on. Okay. Um, Right, so like the um, the formal reality is the subjective nature of the representation. In this context, that doesn't right like um, the subjective nature of a shape is its nature as existing in a certain subject, like a body. The subjective nature of a representation is like. It's, it's nature, it's quality that makes it what it is when we regard it as what it really is, a modification of a certain subject that is a thinking thing or mind. Okay, so I mean, so far representation is just like a shape or a color. Well, a color, of course, according to Descartes or Kant for that matter, bodies don't exactly really have colors, but... Um, that's why shape is a better example, right? So, so like so far, it's exactly like everything I've said about representation could be said about a shape too. A shape has a certain um, essential quality because a shape is a mode of a kind of uh, of an extended substance or body. Its essential quality is its quality as existing in a certain kind of subject, or you could call it its subjective nature. Um, but Um, sorry about this. All right. Um, but a representation, as I said, is a special kind of being or entity in addition to its own nature that makes it what it is. Unlike other beings or entities, it also refers or relates. And refer, I think, is the right word, but uh, uh, Camp Smith often translates bezieht uh, auf as relates to rather than as refers to. So, um, 
So it refers or relates to something else other than itself. And the, the thing other than itself that it relates to is called its object. Right, so a representation is an entity that not only has its own nature in itself, but it also somehow refers to something else outside of itself. It has an object. Um, or at least it claims to have an object. Sometimes representations uh, are, as Kant says, empty, you know, they, they fail to refer to an object, but it's, uh, but it's the nature of a representation is, so to speak, to try to refer to something and the thing that it tries to refer to is its object. And um, in the same way as you can call this the formal reality or form of the representation, um, this can be called the matter of the representation. So this is matter, like um, it's matter in the sense of where we ask like, what's the subject matter of this book, right? That is, what is the book about? So the object is what the representation is about, right? So if the representation is the concept dog, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, or, well, maybe I shouldn't use that example. If the representation is a representation of what's affecting me now as a dog, Right, so like I'm seeing something and I see it as a dog, then um, it's what it's about is that dog. So its object is a dog. Or you could say its matter is a dog. Yes, question. Um, so is it like in the material world, there are objects and then in our minds, there are representations of those objects, but those two things aren't the same. And that your representation is, is almost your experience to that object matter? Well, so, I mean, um, Um, that's true, except the way you used, used object and material is confusing in this context, <laughs> right? So, because again, as I said last time, Kant doesn't use object as a synonym for thing or entity or being the way we do. Kant, when Kant talks about objects, it's always the object of something. Right, I said it's, you know, compared to what, like we would ask, like, you know, what is the object of your inquiry, right? Or like, what is the object of this plan, right? So, so it's, so, so first of all, it's not, um, it's not Kant's terminology and it's confusing when we're trying to understand Kant to say something like in the world, there are objects. Right, like on this desk, there are four objects, you know, or whatever. Right, I mean, object it always means, and uh, like at least in our context, an object is always the object of representation. So that's one thing, and the second thing is you said, well, in the material world. So I mean, uh, um. Kant, Kant does have a use of matter like that, where matter means the movable in space, basically like bodies, right? Um, but that's not the way we're using matter here. This is the matter of this representation. Its object is its matter. Its matter is what it's about. So like, um, um, 
but it's true that the object is not the same as the representation. The representation, as I said, refers to something outside of itself. That would be true whether the, the, rep, the object of the representation is a body or the object of the representation could be um, uh, some state, some one of my own states, right? So it could be something about me, which, uh, well, is that not a body? That gets complicated. We'll talk about that later. But in any case, um, it's uh, the the important thing is not that the representation and and its object have are like are like different kinds of being. I mean, the end, Kant is going to deny that actually, that the representation and its object are different kinds of being. But, um, but, the import, but it is important that the representation is not the same as its object. Did that, does that help answer the question or did that cause more confusion? Um, so it's not, it's not like there's a, a material, there's not like there's objects in space necessarily. It's more of that there's an object matter that relates to the representation in the mind. Is that? Well, the, the representation in the mind is a representation because it it represents something, right? Because it's about something. An object <laughs> is the term we use for that thing that it's about or represents. Okay, I, th I think, okay. I think I need to think about this more. <laughs> okay, well, um, I mean, again, it's just like, try not to get confused by the, by, I mean, let, let put it this way. Like if you say there are, I mean, if you say Kant, are there things in space? Kant will say, yes, there are things in space. And is our representation a representation of something in space? Yeah, like for example, if it's if it's a representation of a dog, a dog is a thing in space, right? So it's a representation of a thing in space. So there are things in space, and there are representations of them in our mind, and you know, so like there's nothing wrong about that. The only thing I'm objecting to is is then switching from calling them things to calling them objects, just because again, like. Normally, you know, that's like perfectly, perfectly, that's the way we use the word object now. But in this technical context, object is not a synonym for thing. All right. I don't know if, um, if you think of other questions later that will help clarify this, or if someone else has a question, let me know, because I don't know how to explain it any better, but I know it's confusing. Um, and it's it's not in this case, I mean, there's a lot of cases where the actual thing that Kant is saying is hard to understand. But in this case, it's not so much what he's saying is hard to understand. It's just hard to it's hard to understand how he's using the terminology. Okay, so in any case, so far, all of this, I mean, uh, like in order to to talk to, uh, Sam about it, I had to bring in some concrete examples. But what I actually said about Kant so far is really abstract, right? Like we don't know what kind of being this object is, uh, how this other thing refers to it and represents it. Um, um, now what I want to do is get into more detail about, according to Kant, how our human representations achieve this um, this function of reference to an object. Um, so I'm going to erase this big picture, this big picture where the representation is just a little blob and draw a bigger bigger picture of the representation. So like so according to Kant, a complete representation of an actual object has two parts. Um, there's a concept and an intuition. 
No, what I was saying, an, an intuition. <laughs> All right, a concept and an intuition. Now, I mean, so this is not part of the definition of representation in general. And in fact, Kant thinks we can conceive of a kind of mind um, whose representations wouldn't have these two parts. But our representations, when they work, when they succeed in referring to an object, always have these two parts. Okay, so the... Um, the simpler one to understand, well, the way to start explaining what this difference is, anyway, is to start with intuition. What is an intuition? So Kant says that, um, here we go. This is on page 65. Um, in Kemp Smith, and it's uh, B33. Okay. In whatever manner and by whatever means a mode of knowledge. And so there's a footnote here. Um, a mode of knowledge, Ina Erkentness. So I'm going to say something about what that word Erkentness means in a second. But in whatever manner and by whatever means a mode of knowledge may relate to objects, intuition is that through which it is in immediate relation to them. Um, let me stop there for a moment. Um, so a mode of knowledge, so this German word Erkentness, um, this is like, in English, we have a word ken, like beyond our ken. I think that's the only phrase it's still used in. This is like somehow cognate to that. Um, uh, Kemp Smith usually translates this as knowledge. Other people, and I've come to feel like this might be better translation, tend to translate it as cognition. There's something to be said for translating it as knowledge. For example, uh, book four of Locke's essay concerning human understanding, which in English is about knowledge. In the German translation, it's about Erkenntnis, right? And in contemporary German, uh, epistemology is called Erkenntnis Theorie, right? So, there, so Erkenntnis often is equivalent to the English word knowledge. Um, um, one problem, which is what you see in that passage you just quoted, is that unlike the English word knowledge, Erkentness is a count noun. It has a it has a singular and a plural, right? So you can talk about Erkentness, which or Ina Erkentness is what he says here. So that would be like if you could say a knowledge or knowledges, which you can't say in English. And in order to uh, deal with that. That's why Kemp Smith inserted the word mode there that wasn't in German, right? So like in German, Kant says, by whatever means a, an Erkentness may uh, be related or refer to its object, but uh, you can't translate it as by whatever means a knowledge may be related to its object. So Kemp Smith translates it as a mode of knowledge. Um, Okay, so I mean, one reason to the, that's one reason, that's one disadvantage of the translation knowledge, which cognition doesn't have, right? You can say a cognition or cognitions, that's fine. Um, the, you know, there are other issues, which is that, I mean, uh, um, 
as I said last time, our knowledge really consists of judgments. But an erkentness is really, the way Kant uses it, is like a successful representation of an object. But it's not yet a representation of it as something. So it's not yet a judgment. Or anyway, it's not necessarily yet a judgment. A judgment maybe could also be called an erkentness, according to him. Um, moreover, sometimes he talks about false erkentness, which makes sense if you translate it as cognition, but is weird if you translate it as knowledge. Okay, anyway, I'm just telling you that for your information. Um, since we're using Kemp Smith, this is going to be knowledge most of the time, um, or as in this case, mode of knowledge. Right, so let me get back to, to what Kant says in the um, passage I just quoted. In whatever manner and by whatever means a mode of knowledge may relate or refer to, I, I would translate, may relate to objects, intuition is that through which it is an immediate relation to them. So what this means, what does immediate mean? It's the opposite of mediates. <laughs> Right, immediate means not mediate. Oops, you can't see the board, hold on. Immediate means not mediate, which means that um, there's nothing in between. There's no medium or means in between something and something else. That's like what immediate means, generally speaking. Now, I mean, uh, the most common use of immediate in everyday life, when we say like, do this immediately, we mean that what there shouldn't be in between is there shouldn't be any time in between now and when you do it, right? That's why immediate means like right away. Um, but here we're not talking about time. What we're talking about is whether there's something between the representation and its object. So a representation refers immediately to its object if it doesn't do it by means of something else, but refers to it directly. Direct. You can maybe understand a lot of things that Kant says about immediate if you if you substitute direct, right? Like not by means of something else. Um, so um, by means of what else? Like, I mean, that is so like, if I have a representation of a dog, there are things between me and the dog, right? There's like air between me and the dog or whatever. Um, so, uh, well, see, I'm thinking about seeing the dog. In some sense, the fundamental way to, to sense a body is to touch it, not to see it. Right, is when you touch it, the body is actually pressing you. Um, you're you're actually feeling the force that that constitutes the way the body takes up space. When you see the body, there's you know. But in any case, even if I touch a dog, there's still like a space between me and the dog. It's or in any case, there's still stuff between my mind and the dog, right? Like my nerves or something, you know. Um, so, but it's an, an immediate representation is one where there isn't another representation between it and its object. So intuition is kind of like the last piece of representation before we go out to the object. This is where the representation ends. And from there we go straight directly to the object. So a representation or part, part, part of a representation, um, you know, 
Kant off, will often say, call concepts and intuitions on their own representations, but other times he says something like, every concept is only a partial representation. And I think, again, that's because like, you can call the concept by itself a representation because it's already kind of trying to refer, but it can't succeed without the intuition. And so, I mean, you can see why in this picture, if this is true, it can't succeed without the intuition. Because if the concept is not an intuition, and I'm not saying anything about what concepts or intuitions are like yet, I'm just basing it on that one definition that the intuition is immediately, refers immediately to the object. So whatever the intuition is, if a concept is not an intuition, that means it doesn't refer immediately to an object. So it needs something else as a means to refer to the object. And the something else, well, could it be another concept? Actually, the answer is yes, it could be another concept. That's basically what happens in a judgment according to Kant. But of course, you can't keep that up forever because every one of those concepts needs something else to refer to the object, right? None of them are intuitions. And so eventually there has to be an intuition to get you the last stretch so you can then refer to the object. So the concept without the intuition is like trying to refer to an object. It's looking around for something it can use as a means to refer to the object, but it doesn't have one. Once it has one, that thing is the intuition. Okay, again, I know this is extremely abstract. Um, uh, I have to say, like I said before, Kant has a tendency to remain very abstract and not introduce a lot of examples. Um, I think he has reasons for that. He talks about his reasons at some point. We'll see. He says more, but in the in the preface, he just says it's you know he didn't have enough room for it. But later on, we'll see. He gives some deeper reasons for not giving more examples. Um, but I'll also say that that moreover, my instinct when I'm trying to understand something very abstract is then to get even more abstract. <laughs> like that's how I try to understand it. Um, so I think I have reasons for that too, but I know it can be confusing. So I am going to bring it down to more concrete details and examples in a second. But um, but it's important to understand that like the definition of intuition, all it says is that it's something that doesn't need something else to refer to an object. It's already all the way there and it can refer by itself, right? So that's what Kant is talking about in the end of that sentence I read before. And to which all thought as a means is directed. So this actually is a little bit of a mistranslation, I think, or anyway, a, um, poorly placed word in the translation, because it's, I mean, that is the German could mean that, but it doesn't. What it means is, and to which all thought is directed as a means. Right, so he's, that is, he's saying what I just said, all thought, is so concepts are part of our faculty of thought, they're acts of our faculty of thought. Um, all thought is directed to intuitions as the means by which it can refer to an object. Um, So it's kind of like all shipping is directed to delivery trucks as a means, <laughs> right? That is um, the shipping uh, is the whole point of the shipping is to get now, I mean, the shipping may like may be much more complicated and intrinsically interesting than the delivery truck, but nevertheless, the whole enterprise of shipping is aimed at getting the goods to the point where they can be put on a delivery truck as a means to get them to wherever they're going. So like similarly thought 
the whole complicated apparatus of thought is aimed at getting to intuitions. And so by means of the intuition, we can finally refer directly to an object. Okay, are there questions about that before I go on? Um, okay, so what does any of this have to do with sensibility? Um, and why is intuition in this sense opposed to thought or concept? Or to put it differently, why are concepts not intuitions, right? That is, why is it that concepts can't refer directly to objects? So like, um, you might think that we would have to have concepts that refer directly to objects. And, um, okay, so I'm gonna erase this. You might think we would have to have concepts that refer directly to objects because like what would be an example of representing an object without referring it to, to it directly? Um, well, um, and this is kind of an Aristotelian conception of representation. Um, I can know something about some being that's not essential to it, that doesn't make it the thing that it is. So like, for example, I can know uh, that um, um, I can know a certain dog as uh, the thing that's two feet long. So I can know it as a quantity. Now that's not the thing that makes it a dog, right? Because a dog doesn't have to be two feet long. It's what Aristotle would call an accident. It's not essential to the dog to be two feet long. Um, um, and this is the way of thinking in which we would have to have objects that uh, concepts that refer directly to objects. You could say, well, you know, um, so it's fine to represent something as like, not as what it is, but as something else like two feet long, but, um, it only makes sense if you have another representation that represents the thing as what it is. So, you know, what it is you're thinking is two feet long, <laughs> right? So like when I, when I think that's two feet long, what is that? I have to have some idea of what that is so I can attribute two feet longness to that. And so the thought would, the, this way of looking at it is something like, um, so we have this like accidental concept, so to speak. And then we have like the essential concept. So this could be like two feet long, and then this could be dog. See, this is why I wish I could draw a dog quickly in a way that makes it clear it's not a horse. Mm -hmm. oh, better. Anyway, so <laughs> it looks more like a sheep, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, so, uh, Right, so this two feet long concept succeeds in representing something because it goes by way of, by means of another concept that represents essentially what it is I'm thinking about. This is a dog. Now, I mean, this last step, if it were possible, would be what Kant calls an intellectual intuition. That is, it would be a kind of thought 
which in our case means a concept um, that uh, refers immediately to an object. And since it refers immediately to an object, it's an intuition. But since it's not a function of sensibility, but rather of the understanding or intellect, it's an intellectual intuition. But Kant thinks we have no intellectual intuitions. That's what defines our human mode of knowledge, in, at least in most general terms. So how does this work then? Like, so, right, so what that means is the concept dog also doesn't refer directly to any object. And I mean, you can see why Kant says that. Why does the concept dog not refer directly to any object? Well, because um, the, like, um, the objects of our representation, insofar as they actually exist, are individual things. This dog, that dog. Um, the concept dog agrees just as well with one dog as another. So there's nothing about it that's sufficient to refer to one dog rather than another dog. So you might think, oh yeah, that's because we need more concepts in between, um, which is kind of like what Leibniz would say about this. Um, but Kant says, no, it's because, the, how is it that we succeed in referring to a particular dog? Um, we have to wait for that dog to affect us. So again, I was talking about this last time. We have our concept as like a rule. It's a rule, now I can say more precisely what it's a rule for. It's a rule which um, certain ways of being affected by external objects can either be in accord with or not. So certain patterns of sensation can either conform to this rule or not. Um, but in order for um, me to represent uh, an actual individual object as conforming to that rule, um, I have to wait for it to affect me in the right pattern. So the way I refer to a particular dog is that I have a concept, and this concept is what Kant would call an empirical concept. It's a concept of that specifies a certain way that sensations can come in. Of course, it's not just one way they can come in, right? It's very complicated. As that's why I was saying before, like last time, that this rule, you know, although you can think of it as a kind of a list of characteristics, it's actually a super complicated rule, right? For because there's so many different ways that a dog that something could affect me that it would count as a dog, <laughs> right? And it's not simple to specify what they are. But in any case, that's what the empirical concept contains. It contains a rule for how something can affect me and count as a dog. But then in order to have an air kentness, a cognition, a successful representation of an actual dog, I need something else. I need um, a sensible intuition. empirical sensible intuition. And that is something that comes from the dog. That is, dog got a little fatter in that picture. That is, um, the dog uh, has to affect me in a certain way. If something affects me in the right way to count as a dog, I'm able to represent it using my concept dog. If nothing affects me one way or the other, then my concept dog is useless. Or as Kant says, empty. 
right? It's only useful for referring to things by means of the way they affect me. And the way they affect me is the part of my representation that refers to them directly. That is, it's the intuition. So that's why, um, again, Kant's characterization of our human knowledge is that on the one hand, our intuitions are all sensible. That is, our representations that refer directly to some individual object are all, are, are all effects of that object on us. And on the other hand, our representations that are not effects of the object on us, but that are, are our own rules that we demand that the object conform to, um, are all general concepts, which means they're all rules to which uh, something could conform to. It affects us in the right way, but the rule by itself doesn't say um, whether anything will ever affect me that way. And it, and, and it doesn't um, specify any individual thing that ever affects me in that way. Um, and so again, the transcendental aesthetic is then focusing on this faculty of sensible intuition that we have. This comes from the Greek word eispesis, which means sense. Um, whereas the transcendental logic will be about this part of the representation, the concept, right? And this, of course, comes from the Greek word logos, which among other things means reason. Um, Okay, so again, every successful representation or like Erkentness mode of knowledge, cognition that we have according to Kant has to have both these pieces. Um, I mean, I haven't explained yet exactly why it has to have this piece, um, but the way Kant explains it is that just being affected by something in itself um, is um, not me doing anything. In particular, it's not me referring to anything. It's 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 kind of like by itself. It's more like the dog referring to me. I mean, obviously the dog isn't affecting me by thinking about me, although according to Leibniz, that is how the dog is affecting me, right? According to Leibniz, when I say the dog affects me, that means that the dog has a clearer representation of me than I have of the dog in a certain respect. <laughs> so like both directions here would be representations. But of course, uh, but uh, Kant doesn't think Leibniz is wrong about this. Um, and certainly doesn't that certainly doesn't agree with our everyday way of, think, of thinking about dogs. I mean, the dog. I'm not saying dogs are not conscious. A dog isn't representing me. But I mean, when I see the dog, the way the dog is affecting me is not by representing me, but by um, reflecting light back into my eyes. When I touch the dog, the way the dog is affecting me is being by by preventing me from moving into the space that it occupies. Um, so, uh, but still, like I said, it's more like the dog is representing me than I'm representing it because this happens according to a rule that isn't my rule. It's, and I said this before, and I'm gonna keep saying this because um, it's the clearest way I know how to explain this. 
the rule by which I'm being affected is the dog's rule, right? It's the nature of the dog that determines when I'm going to be affected. That's why I have to wait for it to happen. Um, uh, I don't, I have my own rules, but I can't derive from them the existence of any individual external thing. By the way, again, according to Leibniz, I do have a rule from which I can derive the existence of external things, namely the principle of sufficient reason, right? So like Leibniz thinks that I know the rule that God used to create the actual world, <laughs> so to speak. Um, I have that rule in my mind too. So in principle, I have in my mind the rule that will generate like um, all the many things that I can ever sense. Um, then obviously Leibniz has to explain why it doesn't seem like we have that. And the answer is it's confused, right? We don't, we don't, we don't uh, represent things sufficiently clearly and distinctly to see how the, this is the, the best possible world and the only one that God could have made. Um, that knowledge is all in us somewhere, but it's all confused, right? Whereas Kant says, no, the difference between clarity and confusion has nothing to do with the difference between um, conceptual and sensible representation. They're different modes of representation. One isn't a confused form of the other. And the, the way they're different, again, is that here, I don't have the rule at all according to which this is going to happen. I have to wait for it. Okay, so this is pretty much the end of that first part. I guess maybe I should say one other thing. As I said before, a representation like this isn't yet a judgment, right? This is just, it's kind of like, uh, um, instead of cognition, you could say recognition. Uh, Kant does use the term recognition for something also, but, uh, but in any case, like uh, it's just successfully representing something as a dog. Um, succeeding in seeing something as a dog or something like that. I'm not yet thinking anything about it that could be true or false. I mean, you in a way you can call, and Descartes says the same thing, like in a way you can call my ideas true or false in that the question is like, do they have objective reality? Is the object they claim to represent actually there? If not, you could call, in a way call them false. And Kant also talks that way sometimes, but like to actually have a piece of knowledge that can be true or false in the usual sense, you have to think something about the dog, like, that dog is big or that dog is uh, a mammal or you know something like that, right? So, um, but nevertheless, this is a lot like a judgment in that uh, something, only we have no concept that tells us what the something is, right? This is the only concept in the picture. So something that is affected in me in some way is being represented as a dog. And uh, Kant will, will say that, you know, in order to apply a general concept to individual cases, we need a faculty, which he calls the faculty of judgment. Um, so, uh, so presumably that's the same thing we use to make judgments properly speaking, but also that faculty of judgment is involved here in applying the general rule to the specific case. There's also another fact that he calls imagination that kind of goes the opposite way. And I'll talk more about those when they come up. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so having added that, that's all I wanted to say in that first part about Kant's terminology here. What intuition, representation, concept, um, sensible, uh, immediate, sensation, I guess I didn't mention sensation, but I, actually it'll be easier to talk about sensation when I talk about the next part. So are there questions before I go on to the second part? I'm sure like, 
you never know what to say to to generate questions at a like this. I'm absolutely sure sure that, uh, that not everyone found what I just said really clear. <laughs> Um, I'm, I think it's likely that no one found that I just said clear at all. Um, so like, if you have a question, chances are a lot of other people are wondering the same thing. But um, without a question, I don't know why it was unclear. So just going to have to go on, but you know, you can interrupt me later and ask me to go back also. All right. So as I said, the second part here is to explain why Kant says, first of all, what Kant means by a pure intuition and why he thinks that space and time are pure form of intuition and why he thinks that space and time are the pure forms of our intuition. I think I, I wrote it first without form, pure intuition, pure form of intuition. I think these are actually the same thing. I'll, I'll try to explain why. Um, So, like I said, the transcendental aesthetic is about our faculty of sensibility as opposed to understanding or intellect. Um, but um, it's not about uh, the various types of sensations that we have. I mean, you will find this something like this, especially in some later British empiricists. Um, you know, they'll begin their book first with a discussion of the sense of smell and then the sense of taste and then the sense of, you know, and uh, um, they'll discuss what color sensations are like and what smell sensations are like and whatever. But, uh, uh, if, you know, if you read the reading, you'll realize the transcendental aesthetic is not about that. Um, but hold on a second. What else is there? To sensibility other than that. Like it's just the senses, how we're affected by objects. Um, when I say how we're affected, I guess I should say how the mind is affected by objects, in particular how the mind's theoretical faculty, right, that is the mind's power of knowing things is affected by objects. Because of course, first of all, um, the mind is affected by objects when they cause pleasure or pain. Kant mentions that several times and says that's, that doesn't belong to our inquiry here. Because that's the way the mind is affected by objects with respect to its practical faculty, right? Like that has something to do with external objects determining or trying to determine my will, try, contributing to my decision of what to do or not to do. Um, but, uh, you know, so, uh, and of course, uh, things affect my body in all kinds of ways. Um, but we're talking about how things affect my mind, particularly in its theoretical faculty. And um, though that is basically, you might think that, that that is just sensations. So what is there to talk about here other than kind of a catalog of the kind of sensations we have? Um, Well, what does it mean that we're affected by the object of our representation? That sensibility is our power to be affected by an object of representation or to represent something insofar as we're affected by it. Um, so that is what makes the faculty of sensibility passive. So I already said um, what it is, right? It's the fact that there's no rule or principle in ourselves from which the sensations can be derived. We have rules that we can compare them to, but uh, um, to see if they conform to them or not, those are our empirical concepts. 
but we don't have rules for um, figuring out which sensation is going to come next. We have to wait and see what they're going to be. Um, a, this is, first of all, a, a way to get closer to understanding what Kant means by a being with an intellectual intuition. Um, Kant says, I think it's in the reading for next time, he says, like, a being that was able to derive the manifold of its sensations, which means basically like what is manifold in its sensations, the, the plurality of its sensations from its, from its own simple knowledge of itself would be to have an intellectual intuition. So like it would be the rule to which the, all the actual objects have to conform in order to exist. So the prime example of something we might, uh, we might want to think of as a being with an intellectual intuition would be God, right? This is the way, I mean, uh, Kant is going to say that, like, we have no idea how this is even possible. <laughs> but he says, like, when we conceive of it, think of it as possible, we, uh, like, we, we, we seem to be forced to think of a being like this as one on which its objects depend for their existence. So that's why, you know, from its rule, all the individual things that are going to happen to it can be derived. But we're not like that, right? So we don't create the objects of our knowledge. We have to wait for them to affect us. And um what that means is so let me go back to the intellectual intuition if i were to ask like what is the order in the way the intellectual intu intuition represents its object. Now, order of what? Well, we don't know, right? Like, again, Kant says, we don't know how this is even possible. So there's no way to talk about this except really abstractly. But if, if we say, if there's some order to the way um, uh, an, an intellectual intuition represents its object, what is that order? Well, it's the order which um, this being put into the object in making it exist. So it's the very nature of the object itself is what has to establish the order by which it's represented. Again, how is that possible? What would that be like? We don't know, according to Kant. It's totally different from the way we do it. The way we do it is the object does have a rule in itself for doing stuff. The nature of the object, it's Bischoffenheit or essential quality, right? Um, but we don't have that rule in us. Um, so like um, our representation of it isn't ordered by its own nature. What is it ordered by? Well, again, remember, like we, I said, we have to wait to see how it affects us. We have to wait means the order by which we represent it is time. Um, And if it's an external thing like a dog, not only do we have to wait for it to affect us, but it has to affect us from a certain distance in a certain direction. Or I guess since it's extended, there's an order to the parts of the way it affects us. And the order of the parts is the order of different distances and directions. So that so for external things like dogs, um, the order by which we represent them is both time 
right? Where we waited and saw sensations come in one after another and space where like we, when the sensations came, they came from different directions and different distances. Um, So again, this order of space and time is unlike in the case if we had an intellectual intuition, where this order would be the order that we put in the object in creating it. So it would be the nature of the object we're representing, like its essence. I mean, in this case, we didn't put any order into the object in creating it because we didn't create it. Right? So what is this order? And Kant says, well, this order is a characteristic of our faculty of sensibility. It's the order in which we're able to be affected by things. Right, so I guess, so that's why like the only way I could express the fact that um, um, we're dependent on a rule in the external object in order to represent it is to say, we have to wait to see how it affects us. Because waiting through time and receiving a series of sensations in time is the nature of our capability of being affected by something. So, the mind again. So, like, this is important to understand, although it's weird to understand. Um, right? In the mind, there's like a power or faculty. Power and faculty, as I think I said, no, that was my other class. Power and faculty are basically alternative possible translations of the Greek word dunamis. And Kant, Kant usually uses them interchangeably, although sometimes he makes a distinction between faculty and other kinds of power. But here, I think he's not. So there's a power or faculty of sensibility. So like, um, um, you know, just as in a piece of wood, there's a power or faculty of being burnt. <laughs> in us, there's a power or faculty of being affected in such a way as to uh, allow us to represent the thing that's affecting us. Um, and uh, when that power or faculty or potentiality is actual, um, then we have an empirical intuition. So this, as we would say in uh, Aristotelian terminology, is the act of the is an act of the faculty of sensible intuition. Um, it's not act as in active as opposed to passive. In Greek, it wouldn't even be the same word. Um, it's act as in actual as opposed to potential. Right? This is an actual intuition. This is the power of sensible intuition. This is an actual sensible intuition. So the sensible intuition um, of course, has a part of it that refers, or that at least if we bring a concept in to finish it, will succeed in referring to some object like the dog. This is the part that's due to the dog. But it also 
Yeah, I mean, again, these two parts are not like spatial parts, obviously. They're two aspects of something or something like that. It also has an aspect which is um, um, the general nature that all our intuition, all our actual intuitions have, because they're all acts of the same power or faculty, our power or faculty of intuition. So there's something that's different in all of them that's due to the particular object of reference. And there's something that's common to all of them that's due to the nature of our ability to represent things by being affected by them. Um, and what is it that's common to all of them? by virtue of being acts of our particular way of being able to sense things? Well, it's that order, the order in which we're capable of being affected. Right, so what our power or faculty contributes here is the order, space and time is what Kant is gonna say it is. And I just like at least, somewhat explain why that makes sense that you would say that space and time. So like what our power or faculty or potentiality for uh, sensible intuition contributes is the order in which we're capable of being affected. But then what the object contributes, so this direction here is reference, right? But this direction here is causation. The object is affecting us. Um, so what the object contributes is what happens in that order, right? Like what sensations do I get at each particular time from each di di particular direction, et cetera. That doesn't depend on the nature of my faculty. That depends on what objects are affecting me. So what all the sensible intuitions have in common is that order, and that order is um, their nature regarded simply as modes, um, states, accidents of a thinking thing, of a mind, right? So their formal nature, is that order, right? That's their subject, common subjective character. The common character they have as all being sensible intuitions of this kind of thinking subject. That's their formal, their common formal nature. They're all the same in that respect. Um, and then they're different in their um, objective or material nature that is in what object or matter they refer to. So this part that's contributed by the object is what Kant calls a sensation. The sensation is the effect of the object on me. So an empirical intuition contains a sensation. And whenever I, whenever, again, whenever I successfully refer to an actual object, it's because it actually affected me. Or um, it affected something, right? That is, it, it may not be that I'm directly touching it or seeing it, right? But it's, as Kant will say later, bound up with my sensations, right? That is, by, by some uh, chain of causation, it's affected me. Um, so that's why, like, as I said, an actual empirical intuition always contains a sensation. But an actual empirical intuition also always contains this formal aspect. And by abstraction, 
right? That is basically say, basically by like ignoring this part and just focusing on this part. Um, we can talk about the form of sensible intuitions in general. And that form of sensible intuitions in general is not itself a sensation, right? It's an order in which sensations can arrive. It's not itself a sensation. So when Kant says that space and time are pure forms of intuition, Pure means not empirical. And form means this, that it's the formal nature that all our sensible intuitions have in common. So that's why I said pure and form pretty much say the same thing here, right? It's the pure form of sensible intuition. It's, it's both pure and formal because it's you get to it by ignoring the specific sensation that's found in a given sensible intuition and just focusing on the part that it has in common with all the others, which is its formal nature. Right? So what Kant is saying is that space and time, what are space and time? Space and time are character are the characteristics of our power of sensible intuition, or therefore space and time are the order that in common characterizes all our actual sensible intuitions. Um, So like, and it's clear that I'm not gonna get to very much of bottle, all of part three, but I anticipated that to begin with. Um, uh, so I will try to conclude this part two though. <laughs> Hold on. It's unlocked. Sorry. I'm teaching now. Okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, okay, so notice what this doesn't mean. Um, it doesn't mean that space and time are a kind of like ghostly grid that we see inside our head and sensation is like the filling that fills in the grid. I think like people often think that Kant means that. And by people, I don't just mean like, um, like students or something. I mean, like uh, interpreters of Kant often think that he means that, right? And I mean, you can see why you would think that he means that based on this these words. It's the pure form of intuition and sensation is the matter. So it's easy to think of the form as something like a kind of shape that has to be filled in by the matter, right? So like, and then how can it be filled in? Well, I guess that's where the grid comes in, right? Like it's a kind of shape that has spaces in it that you can stuff sensations into. Right, like, you know, this would be related to the place where Aristotle says that the form um, is like the spherical shape of a bronze sphere, whereas the bronze, the matter is like the bronze of a bronze sphere. Um, so it's what in medieval Latin is called mat materia ex qua, the matter out of which, right? The matter out of which something is made is the matter that's, so to speak, inside the shape that defines the thing. Now, I mean, um, not necessarily literally something filling in a shape, according to Aristotelians, but anyway, like it's that way of thinking about form and matter that generates this idea that what Kant is saying is that See, I mean, it's easier to see this with space than with time. That's one warning sign, but I guess you would think of time this way, as a kind of ghostly line 
But what about the fact that we're kind of going down? What does that mean? <laughs> right? As, I mean, as Kant says at some point, yeah, we represent, we have, we can only represent time to ourselves as a line in space. But this line is not the same as time because the line, parts of the line are simultaneous, whereas the parts, parts of, space, uh, of time are successive. But anyway, just go back to the space thing, right? Like, so think of, this is why we, we, we tend to think space, Kant is saying that space is like a ghostly grid and to have experience means for the grid to be filled in with sensations. But of course, even without sensations, we can look at the grid and learn certain things about the grid. And that is how we would get synthetic a priori knowledge. Um, but I don't think this could be right because seeing a grid inside, like a ghostly grid inside your head um, is still a posteriori. You don't know in advance whether you can do that, right? Like you have to try to do it. Certain things you can picture inside your head and certain things you can't picture inside your head. And the only way to find out is to try. Um, so, um, and then when you, if you succeed in, in imagining a ghostly grid, and then you start examining it to see, okay, in that grid, what is the shortest distance between two points or something like that? Um, uh, that's experience. Right, I mean, it's a kind of like fantasy part of experience or something like that, you know, uh, like a dream, but uh, but still experience. It's not, um, it's still something you have to wait to see how it comes out. Just as much as if you had to measure an actual grid, right? So, um, so this is not really uh, an explanation for how we can have synthetic a priori knowledge. Because any knowledge we got out of this wouldn't be a priori. So um, I think this is actually completely the wrong way to think about it, which is unfortunate because this way of thinking about it is much harder, but I think it's right that, that form here, so matter here doesn't mean materia ex qua. It means what in medieval Latin they call materia circa quam, the matter about which. Again, so again, the matter of representation is its object, the thing it refers to. And the form in contrast to that is the, is the subjective nature of the representation. The representation regarded in abstraction from the fact that it refers to something just as a kind of act of my faculty. Um, and now you can see how this makes synthetic a priori knowledge possible because um, um, in order to affect me at all, something has to affect me in this order. I don't have to wait to see if it will affect, affect me in this order or not. And this is getting towards things I would have said in, in the third phase, like what's the argument for this? I couldn't wait and see whether it's gonna affect me in that order or not. Why not? Because as I just said before, this order is the order of waiting and seeing, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, it's the fact that this is the way I can be affected by a, uh, an object of representation is what makes the order of my sensible intuitions and order of waiting through time and seeing in what order they, in what like uh, sequence they affect me. So uh, even though I may not, and I mean, I certainly don't realize all, uh, you know, all at once what all the implications of that order are. Right, like I'm not, we're not born knowing all the theorems of geometry or something. But again, like a priori does not mean innate or that you knew it before you were born or that you knew it at some special a priori time. It means that whenever you do know it, 
you know that you, you don't know it based on experience. And again, like what you know based on the characteristics of this order can't be based on experience because this order is the condition on which you can learn things from experience. You have to be able to represent things as happening one after another and coming from different directions in order to have experience. Like imagine trying to do induction to prove that there's such thing as space and time. You know, so induction means first you look at this case, you say, okay, yeah, this is, is in space and time. Then you look at another case, all right, this one's in space and time. Then you look at another case, all right, this one's in space and time. But like, obviously what I was just doing presupposed that they're all in space and time. First look at this one, then look at this one, then look at this one. Right, so that's both at least the beginning of how, of, of how Kant argues that space and time must be this pure form of intuition and how if they are, it's clear that we can get uh, synthetic a priori knowledge. Why is it synthetic? Well, it's, you know, it's synthetic because um, um, this pure form of intuition um, like, isn't part of our concept of any object. It does, this, this is the faculty of sensibility. It doesn't have anything to do with concepts. So if I can connect two concepts like short and straight by showing that this order implies they go together, this order is the X that allows me to connect them. Okay, um, I'm out of time. So, uh, um, I'll have to stop there. I will say uh, I'm planning to have office hours for the first time, and I think they're going to be on Wednesday um, next week, but I have to figure out exactly what time. I will let you know. And then I think my in-person office hour when it starts will be on Tuesdays, but that won't start for another two weeks. So I'll let you know about both of those. Um, and I will see you later. Bye.